our first uh, one book event of the semester. We've had a couple of smaller events, but obviously this is our first big event. And I'm so excited to see all of you here. Um, as I'm sure you all know, our one book this year is I Am Malala. And we have a great panel planned for you today called Education Across the World. We have a number of panelists from our BCC community, faculty, staff, and students with international experience in education who are going to speak to us about education in their countries. It's my honor to introduce to you Livia Newber. Livia is the program coordinator for our ESL program. She, um, I contacted her to, to ask her if she could help us identify some international students who would be um, interested in participating in this event. Livia was so helpful and so excited that she said, oh, I'd love to do that, and I can help plan it, and I can talk about Brazil, and I'll facilitate it. <laughs> You're hired. So um, <laughs> with no further ado, let me introduce Livia Newberg. Thank you very much. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, this is one of the many events that will take place um, this semester to accompany the book, I Am Malala. Um, and I would like to introduce you to our panelists today. Um, starting over here, uh, we have Jennifer Deckers Mitchell. Uh, she is here representing the Netherlands. And uh, she is the administrative assistant for the LASH division for teaching and learning. And she is also in, an adjunct instructor in the business division here at BCC. Um, next, we have Professor Ravita. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Representing India, and she is the chair um, of the Early Childhood Education Department here at BCC. Um, next, we have Fatima Javed. She is a student here at BCC um, in the uh, dental hygiene program. She started in the ESL program. And next we have Muna Ferdowsi. She is represent. Oh, I'm sorry. Fatima is representing Pakistan. Uh, Muna is representing Bangladesh, and um, she is in the liberal arts program here at BCC. Also a student. Next we have um, Mr. Jose Buten from the Dominican Republic. He is in the criminal justice program here at BCC. Um, then we have. Uh, our friend um, Somia, and uh, she is representing Morocco. Uh, she's in the ESL program here at BCC. Um, and myself, um, I'm Livia Newbert, and I. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Engen, I'm so sorry. Atase, um, he is an assistant professor of education here at BCC and he's representing Turkey. And then myself, <laughs> uh, I'm Livia Newbert, and I'm the coordinator for the ESL program here at BCC, and I'm representing Brazil. Okay, so we're gonna start. Um, our panelists are gonna speak a little bit about education in their native countries. Each panelist will speak for about three minutes. Um, and then um, after everyone's spoken, I'm going to go back and ask, ask them a couple of more questions that they will give answers to and then we'll open it um, for you if you have any questions at the end, okay? So, Mr. Engen, uh, we're gonna start with you, okay? okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, good morning everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm not a morning person, so if I freeze, uh, just bear with me. <laughs> um, Turkey, I was born and raised in Turkey but unfortunately, I only uh, did my elementary school in Turkey. I, after that, I've been traveling around. Um, I've experienced different educational settings. Um, one was in Saudi Arabia. Another one, I actually attended a Pakistani school in, in Turkey. Um, so I, have a, I had a very uh, turbulent educational journey. But I've done research on uh, the education in Turkey. Uh, I'll just talk about briefly the historical setting so you'll have a better understanding of uh, the Turkish education system. Uh, the modern 
or maybe I shouldn't call it modern, but the Republic of Turkey was created in 1923 from the remains of uh, what, it, what was known as the Ottoman Empire. And uh, the Turkish nation had uh, a very nationalistic ideology at that time. And the significant other of that ideology was not the West or was not a certain enemy, but it was the past, the, the, the Ottoman Empire past which was perceived to be illiterate or not westernized enough. So the, the Turkish nationalism that was set up in 1923 that has influenced education in Turkey was based on a very nationalistic ideology. Now at that time, um, the, 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 the policy makers had a huge challenge. Uh, the nation was just coming out of World War I. Uh, the industry was not there, it was crumbling, and it was basically a peasant society. So they had to jumpstart the economy and uh, they implemented the progressive ideology uh, of education in order to recruit peasants uh, into schools and create teachers, the bourgeois, uh, industrialists, and so forth. Um, actually, John Dewey uh, visited Turkey during that time and he praised uh, the progressive outlook of Turkish education policies at that time. And they were really convivial and democratic educational institutions that, that are um, very uh, prominent and influential school settings that were set up back then called village institutes. They would recruit villagers and work through their cultural capital, allow them to be more empowered, allow them to have control of their environment and economy. Um, but unfortunately, by the 1950s, uh, and this goes into the Truman Doctrine and uh, the policy of containment during that Cold War era, the convivial, the democratic uh, education institutions that were set up in Turkey uh, began uh, to be perceived as communist, you know, not, not liberal enough, and they were perceived to be a bit too uh, socialist. And they were slowly dismantled by <coughs> the right wing uh, that has always influenced Turkish politics and are probably at their triumph, triumphant uh, peak today. So by the 1950s, uh, the right wing dismantling of democratic progressive education in Turkey starts. And by 1980s, um, the convivial of the democratic premises of Turkish education <coughs> have been undermined by not only the right-wing policies, but also the neoliberal policies. And we, we see that uh, almost everywhere around the world, especially in developing nations. Uh, there was a huge push for privatization, commercialization of education. Um, private schools were established. Public schools were undermined. Uh, public spaces were deemed as failure and as uh, not efficient enough to supplement the, the growing economy, which is the discourse uh, today, uh, not just in Turkey, but also in the United States. Um, so after the 1980s, all the way to today, um, Turkish education system, even though it still retains some of its nationalistic ideology as well as progressive ideologies, it has become highly privatized and um, public spaces are often uh, under, are undermined. Um, I guess that's, that's a little brief history of Turkish education system. Um, there's really not much for me to uh, articulate on the present moment because I, I see that our <coughs> post-industrial neoliberal moment is apparent everywhere in the developing nations, developing world. I'll go here first. Could I make a suggestion? Sure. I noticed they have this wonderful um, BCC, you know, internet access here. Would it be possible for like a picture of the country or something to go on when a person speaks from the country to help? That is a wonderful idea and that we should have thought of before we started. <laughs>
but I appreciate your idea. It's a great idea. I'm trying to put in the lines of country and what you're saying. Oh, she can do it. She can do it. Thank you so much. So forget what I said. She'll do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. on to uh, Mouda now, who will speak a little bit about uh, the education in Morocco. Oh, I'm sorry. See, I'm, I'm so nervous. <laughs> I don't do this every day, okay? So, uh, forgive me. Soumia, who is going to speak about Morocco. Hi, everyone. I am Soumia from Morocco. I, I, I try to give you some information about the education in Morocco. The education system in Morocco is uh, difficult because we study all the classes in Arabic. Uh, but uh, some classes stay uh, in Arabic in the college, like, uh, like economy, law, languages, history, and uh, geography. But the science, math, physics, chemistry, and, uh, and biology and geology become in English, in uh, in French, in the college, uh, the, 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 the classes in Arabic is not necessary to, to go to, to, to the college, just if in the test or in the quiz. But uh, the science classes, you must to, to go to the class. And uh, there is no part-time or full-time in the, all the classes. For time, the, the government give, give us to the financial aid like in United States, but it, there is a little difference. They give us a check every three months. You can do anything for about this money, by, by clothes, uh, traveling, anything, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no orientation. <laughs> For any level, um, uh, preschool, middle school, high school, and, and uh, the college, no uh, orientation. And, uh, sorry. <coughs> and the government make uh, build the schools in the nomad two, for the nomad two. Uh, for to fight uh, the illiteracy. Illi 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 Thank you. 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 Thank say that the educational system in the Dominican Republic is somehow very similar to the one in the United States. However, we have some standards that differentiate the system to the one here in the United States, such as the following. We have a free period of school time. For example, students can go in the morning, in the afternoon, and at night. Yeah. Um, all public our public school requires students to wear uniform. Every student has to wear uniform. And we have uh, some private school. They have to wear uniform too, but it's not the same one. Also, we have uh, many private schools, and those are the best. So public school in my, in my country are not good education. So. Also, we don't have um, sport, sport uh, within our educational system. If you are attending to high school or middle school and you want to play sport, you gotta play outside the school. So the school system doesn't have um, any sport that you can play for the school like here. And in higher education, we only have one university, one public university, and that's the best one. We have some private university, but those are not really good. <laughs> <laughs> so, but in order to, to, to go to the uh, public university, 
is very competitive. So you gotta, is there, are, there is a lot of requirements that you have to make in order to get into that university. Also, our system is divided in primary school and secondary school. It's not like here that we got elementary school, middle school, and high school. So from first grade to eighth grade is our primary school. From ninth grade, from ninth grade to twelfth grade is our secondary school. So that's pretty much what's different in my country. Other than that, it's, it's pretty much the same. Thank you. changed uh, since I came in here in Bangladesh education system. I would uh, like to tell you the basic about it. The education system is different from U.S. education system. In U.S. it's like uh, middle school, elementary school, middle school, and high school. But in Bangladesh, kindergarten to fifth grade is elementary, which is called primary school. And then sixth grade to tenth grade is a uh, higher secondary school. Eleven to twelve is college, and then universities for higher ed. It has private and public colleges, public schools, private universities. But for um, from the first grade until tenth grade, if you want to get better education, you better like go to private school to get higher, um, better benefits in school. And public school it's beneficial with the money, but not with really education. Which I attended both private and public schools, so I have a little bit experience of it. For girls, it's really beneficial to uh, beneficial to go to public school because they get free education from uh, first grade until they get their bachelor's degree. If they have really good grade, they get free education. Also, the government will give um, financial aid every six months to students that who has really good grade. Only girls. They didn't do it for guys yet, so they can do anything with that money. And uh, I would like to say about. Uh, uh, it's more theoretical. A student has to memorize more for um, their study and stuff. That's uh, the efficient um, grading doesn't uh, maintain on the class um, class uh, class participation or a project or anything. When I was there, I don't know about it right now. I asked a student from there, and he said it's more theoretical. You have to memorize everything to pass the test. So to get onto the higher level, like from sixth grade to seventh grade, you have to pass the final exam. If you don't pass the final exam, you don't go to the higher class. Same thing with the 10th grade exam and 8th grade exam. They have uh, two different exams for like middle junior school. <coughs> so they have to take the exam to go to 9th grade on 8th grade. And then you have to pass the 10th grade exam to go to college. And the 12th grade exam, which is called HSC Higher School Certificate, you have to pass the exam to get into universities. And if you have lower grade, it's hard to get into a better school or public Public university is the best one right now because they have more, um, have, uh, most student, excuse me, most student get financial aids and stuff. So people like to go to public universities than private universities. So I uh, think that's all. <laughs> they speak English there, but in government school, which is <coughs> terrible. <laughs> they don't have sports, anything, and the teacher, they don't have schedule, like what you are going to study tomorrow, and they will throw stuff on you to memorize, and they wouldn't even tell you, like, okay, next, if the teacher say like, okay, there's test tomorrow, you have to study. They don't have to tell you ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. so, and they don't get financial aid, and the college system, like here in high school, it's from 12th grade 
but in Pakistan, from 11 to 12, it's college, and then you move to university. And in college and private, uh, I mean government and private school, you most of the time, like you wear uniform. When you move to university after college, then it's your choice. If you wanna you wear uniform or like just regular clothes. The system there, the public school is like, when you go to public school, they just gave you books. You have to like, you know, worry about your transport. If you are coming from another city, they're not paying for anything and you are not really learning anything. But in private school, you pay a lot of money and I think only rich people can afford that. In Pakistan, it's not middle class people, it's lower or higher. And in private school, like if most of students, like when they are rich, they go there because they want to move from the country. And when they move from the country, like they get a job easily. And if you are going, like I got a degree from public school, it, which is for free, but it's very hard to find a job there then. And if you study in private school, they will definitely get, give you a job, no matter how smart you are or not. But they will give you a job because they look at your degree, like how people say, like, oh my gosh, she graduated from Harvard University here. She must be smart. But there is like same thing in Pakistan, like they think of like, oh my gosh, she graduated from private school, she must be smart. So it is very complicated things, like there's a lot of students go to government schools, but <clears throat> like even though they are smarter than private school students, but they can, the only reason they can afford it to go to private school, but they, it's very hard for them to get a job. So I think our government should like, you know, improve the government, uh, give more opportunities to public school because like there, I see a lot of students, or oh, the only reason they are like from lower classes uh, and the, like they pay a lot of, uh, you know, they are very smart compared to uh, private school students. But you know, it's all about money. <laughs> Thank you. Representing India, we have Professor Ravita Amarasimha. Hi, everyone. I guess I'm speaking correctly. Can you hear me? No. No? No, they hold it lower to the mic. Is that good? How is that? Yes, we all have to figure out where the voice is. Okay. Um, I first of all want to thank the One Book Committee for inviting me to be on this panel pretty special to talk a little bit about where I'm coming from and my own experience. I'm seeing familiar faces of my students on the side, so I can't help but smile. Um, okay, I guess I thought I would uh, share with you, I'm trying to tie in a little bit of what everybody's been saying so far. Um, so I'll speak first to the early years before entering college. So I, in India at least, uh, we have a very long ancient history and we've also been influenced by the British colonial system. So as far as the schooling goes, uh, we certainly have what everybody has called government schools are like your public schools, which is funded by the state or the federal government. And then we have private schools. In private schools, we certainly have schools uh, largely started like um, what we call convent schools because they're parochial, like you have St. Anne's and so on, we have a whole bunch of those. And then we have more recently uh, not-for-profit organizations that have started schools as well. And um, there are different, everyone gets a high school certificate, but there are four different centers for that. The federal government has one, and that is called the Central Board of Secondary Education. So they have a set curriculum, which is across the nation, that is especially for people who are in the defense services, because you know, they're serving either in the Air Force, Navy, and so on, and they get transferred, they go out of the country, they come back. So they have their whole curriculum, and that is no matter which state you are in, it's the same curriculum, it's the same central board exam, everybody does exactly the same. So that's one. And then uh, every state has its own uh, higher secondary school certificate, and that is governed by their own state board of education. And again, just like everybody else has said, after every um, middle school, high school, you have end of the year exam, you don't have, you repeat. Uh, no 
no second chances. So that's pretty strict. And then we have another exam uh, which is connected because of the British, we used to have what they call Indian school. Um, it was called the British, the Cambridge School Certificate. We still have the same <laughs> curriculum, but it, all the papers are corrected in India. But it has the same curriculum like going to Cambridge in UK. So, um, so that was all of those things have changed after India got independence in 1947, right? And in a way, I guess when we are talking, you kind of have to look at Bangladesh and Pakistan and India kind of together because it was all one country at one point in 47. It's good for us to learn a little bit of history and I'm always learning a lot about the history of the United States because when you see inequities, you really <coughs> have to look at the history of every country, why there is so much inequity in education. And, uh, and also I think it's wonderful that Bangladesh has special programs for women to advance their education. In India, after independence, uh, the government was very keen for the uh, women to be equal participants in the social economic fabric of the country. So I know a lot of my aunts who got to college, even though the families were not so keen, because they got the money, they had the will, they left home and got educated. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting to see that is how it works out. And at the college level, we have several excellent, well-known universities, and in fact, India is in the center for all of South Asian countries for people to come to go to college. And um, I think, uh, again, over there, it, uh, education is free for those who do really well, and uh, otherwise you're paying a lot of money. But still, it's much less expensive than United States. Um, so we have all kinds of, uh, and I think sometime in after the independence era, I think there was a special partnership with the United States, the land grant university, some of you may be familiar with that. So there were lots of partnerships in developing with the agriculture and you know you have the 4-H clubs with the whole connection with that too. Um, so I think with that I should stop. I mean, one can go on as well, but I'm wondering if there was anything else I missed in here. But I think I'll pass it on. Thank you.
we had to do marketing projects that revolved around event management and hospitality. Um, the other thing that that allows you to do as well is that you have two mandatory six-month internships, which expose you to the workplace and the career field in which you are hoping and planning on working. Um, and then you end with a large capstone project, which is like a large case study that really pulls in everything that you've learned over the last three and a half years. Um, and I just feel that you're so well prepared in that case to enter the workplace. And if I go back, and I don't have any official data, but anecdotally looking at you know, a lot of uh, the people who I graduated with, their employability rate is somewhere in the 90s, and the majority of the people remained in the place where they interned because they had that exposure there. So um, those are some of the things that, I know they happen here as well, but that's very systematic um, in the Netherlands. Um, system in Brazil. Um, I have been in the United States uh, for a little over 15 years now, so a lot's changed in the past 15 years in Brazil, um, for the better, I have to say. Um, just to give you a little bit of data here, um, I, was, I was doing some research before um, coming here, and in 2000, only half of the children uh, finished primary education in Brazil. And Three out of four adults were function functionally illiterate, and more than one in ten were totally illiterate. So that was right about when I came to the United States. The situation, as you can see, was not very good. Um, uh, rich parents would send their children to private schools, which are considered to be primary and secondary education in Brazil. Are considered to be if you go to private school, those are the, where that's where you're going to get good education. Um, and the poor parents, you know, um, knew very little to understand um, anything about, you know, how badly their children were being educated in public schools, which are considered to be very bad in Brazil. Um, so when you graduate from high school, um, you also have to take this national exam in Brazil, and um, really only those, and, and then you go to the federal universities, which um, the best ones are the supported by the government or financed by the government, and they're free. So, um, but to get there, to pass an exam and to get into those federal um, universities and not pay anything for higher education, you have to pass that exam. And only if you had a good basis, only if you're prepared well um, in primary and secondary education, you're able to do that, you're able to accomplish that. So what does that tell you? that the, the, the rich are still getting all the perks. <laughs> and, and the rich get rich and the poor get poor. Well, yes. You got that right. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, that has been the case for many, many years in Brazil. And like I said, a lot has changed and the government um, took note of that and that, that could continue to be the case. So a lot of programs have been created in the past uh, 15, 20 years to stop that, to equalize education, <coughs> education for all. So a lot of pro, um, in, uh, programs that um, try to include the, the minorities um, in Brazil have been implemented and have been very successful. But we still have a long way to go um, in Brazil. And uh, I think, I, I, I mean, like uh, Ravita said, we could talk about this you know, all day long. There's just so much to be said. Uh, but basically what I believe needs to change is, you know, things need to be more equal for everybody, you know. Uh, the primary and secondary education uh, need to be better for those who cannot pay um, so that they have a chance at higher education, you know, go to those um, free uh, federal universities sponsored by the government. So, um, so now what we would like to do is, um, I have a couple of questions that I would like to ask each of the panelists, and uh, I'll ask the first question first. And uh, the question is, what is it about the education system in the United States? I'll, I'll give it back to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about 
the education system in the United States that you think attracts so many people to come here to get an education? How many of you here in the audience today are, no, are from a, another country? Several of you. And something has attracted, you know, something in the American education system has attracted you to come here, one thing or another. And so what, in our panelists' opinion, um, is that one thing that attracts people from their country to come here and, and get educated? You want to go in order? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my response was, first of all, <clears throat> it's cultural capital. One of the panelists hinted to that as well. Uh, a degree from the United States gains a lot more credibility when you go back to your home country. Uh, even though there might be really excellent universities where you're at. Uh, and I just noticed I didn't give you much detail about my context, Turkish context. There are some really good schools in Turkey, but having a degree from the United States uh, makes a big difference in the job market. Uh, second of all, uh, research opportunities are better here, I would say. Um, especially there's a big uh, venture capital mergers that happen in research. One universities in the United States where the research that you do gets rewarded economically. So uh, I see it as cultural capital and research. Also, many students 
Many students are willing to pursue an education in a university where they can play sport at the same time. And in my country, we only have uh, one university that has some sport, not all. And maybe that's why many students are willing to come here and get the, their education in the United States, I would say. Thank you. Bangladesh, the education system. Why student wants to come to the United States, United States to get higher ed? There are many reasons. First reason I would like to say it's a uh, much um, p uh, it's practical. They like to be uh, they don't like uh, theoretical like um, getting memorized everything and then taking the final exam. If you don't pass, you are staying in the class. They want to come here to get higher ed, so they practice on it. They do more research on it. It's all research based. Like if we have a simple one credit class. The teacher will ask us to do research on something, get out, go to the environment, if you're in different major, you have to do research. But there it's uh, not that. So student com comes here to get ex experience from their experiment. So I asked uh, one of my cousins who is an international student, which I am not an international student, I came here with my parents. So he has more experience coming here more than me. So I asked him why he came here. So he was telling me he wants to get uh, more experience from the different uh, cultures. It's more diverse here than there. And then the other problem is political problem. Students get involved in politics very, like when they get into university, they get involved in politics. Well, not all the students, most of them. So there's a conflict starts, like a strike for politics. The student can't go to school because there's a strike on road, the car can't move, the, but there's no bus to go, go to school. So it hurts their education very, very much. So that's a problem they don't like and they want to come here. There is another one I would like to say is the, the problem that uh, why they want to come here is um, also like uh, if they come here, they can get more things. Like they, as uh, everyone else mentioned it, if you get a higher ed from a country like US or United Kingdom, when you go back to another country like third world country, you get a higher position. That's another thing. They like to get education here. But the other factor is money is everything. Whoever rich, they can come here because their parents can afford the money here. It's a, if we convert a dollar from here to Bangladesh, it's like 70, 76 taka. So a middle class or poor family person cannot come here to get higher rent, even though how smart they are. Only the rich ones can come with their higher, like higher education with high level of money. So that's uh, um, that's all I can say. Why do you want to come here to get more experience? Um, that's good. I think like everyone have a similar reason. They they came to United States because for good education. It's much better, even though in other countries, especially in my country, even though if you go to private school, it's not that good compared to United States school. And the big reason is there like, if I go no matter how, if I'm not smart, if I go with the United States degree from here and look for a job, I will get it pretty fast. No matter how the other student is, is smart. <laughs> because like they only look for your degree. Like my one, um, my mom cousin, he came to United States and he said that if someone here even get associate from here and another person get master in Pakistan and go to the same job, looking for the same job, the associate one will get it because he got United States degree. Mm -hmm. And he will get more facilities. So that is the thing, like, it's only about degree. They don't look how smart you are and it's all about degree. Like, okay, you got a degree from United States, you can find a job pretty fast. This is what I believe like most of people come here because so they can get job and they can they have more better facilities here. Like there is like no internships, not other stuff. You can really experience, you know? Like you will learn every single thing from the book. And they look at the theories like in lab science classes, you will practice, like practically work on something. But there you can only study in the book. This is how it's what they never do experience unless you get in real life and start working on it, you know? 
So nothing is impractical there, but there is a lot of things in practicals and more facilities there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. very difficult like now they are starting there but it's especially like when you go to public school don't even think about that you are going to do something in science classes practical you have to learn memorize all the theories and how it's right <coughs> there's no way that you can learn in practical <laughs> um, we're going to have some time at the end for questions so hold that thought okay we'll, we'll get to it in just a couple of minutes and i'll be brief yeah I just forgot to mention earlier when I was speaking that in India we have 28 languages and almost every state has its own language. Uh, all of us learn at least three languages. Uh, you learn the national language, you learn the language you speak at home, and we all learn English. And because we've all had English, it has made us very mobile in the world, I guess. Know, because we are still able to go to all the countries because we still speak English in addition to two other Indian languages. So I just want to mention that. Um, okay, why did we all come to the United States? I guess uh, everyone makes a choice, and certainly the United States uh, has the largest number of higher education universities and colleges in the world. If you didn't know that, it's number one. And two, I think the United States also offers a variety of combinations of programs that are, uh, have a current um, research <laughs> edge to it, which many other countries don't have. However, in India, it's very, very well known for some excellent universities. In fact, many um, colleges from here send groups of people to recruit Indian people to come to their universities, but they take what I would say uh, the creme de la creme, the very top, they tip off the cream from the milk on the top and they bring them here. So as far as in India goes, when people come back from here with their degrees, they are trying to make sure that everybody who is graduating from India itself, they are on the equal footing. So they are not getting, usually not getting preferential treatment for any regular state or federal government jobs. In fact, they would prefer if it is somebody from an Indian university because they speak the local language as well. They are able to work with the populations. So I'm not sure it's the same in that sense over there. But um, another reason I think many people come to you know, states also is, you know, especially in India, there's a lot of brain drain, but those who are, have an intellectual advancement, they're not getting advancing higher, so they're able to come here and do research and be more mobile as well, and also, and then other big piece is certainly, maybe for those who are born and raised here, you don't realize how the justice system, most often, I know we've had some recent issues, so barring that, but people have a voice where you can be heard, and I think that's a reason I think uh, many people certainly come to United States, uh, when you can fight for what's right. I know it's not easy, it's a system after all. Uh, and finally, I think uh, the other piece is, you know, all the colleges and institutions are accredited, so they have a standing, and they have a certain quality of education you can expect, and uh, I think that's another reason people do come to <laughs> Because we're awesome. <laughs> Sweet. That's why, because we're awesome. And uh, in a way, he's right, because you know that's why we're all here. I mean, because the United States has um, a lot of great things to offer, and, and that's why we're, we're all here. But in the words of my uh, fellow panelists here, you know, marketability is certainly a factor. Um, if you go back to Brazil with a degree from the United States, you get a job like that. You know, I mean, they do care <laughs> if you have brains or not, uh, but it, it certainly helps to have a degree from the United States. 
uh, research. There's a lot of opportunity here for research. Um, diversity. I finished college in, in Brazil, and I came here after that. Um, and I have to say, it wasn't until I came here that I realized how wonderful the world is and how much diversity is out there. I think I, I'm going to speak for Brazil, but um, we're very um, limited to what happens in our own country, in our own turf. We're not exposed to, you know, so many things on a daily basis. You know, um, different faces, different cultures. Um, on a daily basis, and so this is what makes it so great as well to be here. And also sports, I have a lot of friends that come here on scholarships, sports scholarships, um, um, because in Brazil still, that's not something, we have great athletes, but unfortunately sports is not something that is um, encouraged or you know it's as great as it is here in colleges and universities in the United, in the United but States. But country has soccer. I know. Well, let's not even go there. Let's not even go there right now. But uh, let's just forget what happened uh, for now. Until, you know, until 2000 and whenever it happens again. Um, but anyway, as I was saying, I had to bring that up. Um, because we don't have a German uh, panel member. Uh, what's that? Yeah, good thing we don't have. Which is funny, very funny. Uh, States, when students start college here, they're very dispersed. They're, they're not sure what they want to study. So they wonder for a while before they decide what they want to major in. <laughs> and I think that's, that's something that could be uh, overcome with a more specialized degree offering. <coughs> and that brings in uh, a, a social advantage as well. When I attended college in Turkey, uh, I had a community of students. You know, I knew everybody, everybody knew me. Um, and that solidarity, that sense of community is important in higher ed. Uh, students are more political in Turkey. They're more aware of uh, what's going on in their government, in their cities, in their communities. And I think that stems from that uh, solidarity that they find in departments, in degree departments. Um, in K through 12, I think in Turkey, uh, the, the, the premises of uh, in loco parentis, which you read in the Rolanda book, uh, teachers are in, in place of parents in schools, and they are treated that way. Um, they, they receive more respect from students as well as the community, even though it's deteriorating today. But uh, there's still a high respect for the profession in Turkey, and, and as, as well as from the students, not just from parents, but students also respect their teachers a lot more. I've, I've taught K-12 schools here, and I I haven't really seen, <laughs> seen much respect uh, in the teachers in learning, whatever. But um, in Turkey, uh, for instance, if, if a teacher enters the class, everybody stands up. And they don't sit until the teacher tells them to sit there. Uh, so it's that, that respect I like that
country in the world. Uh, uh, ther other third world country like uh, the Dominican Republic, uh, I would say, tend to copy the improvement that the United States has made in education. But one thing that I would say that the United States can improve is the way that they judge uh, high school students. Because in order to get a high school diploma, you got to pass the end. At the end cap. And in my country, it's not like that. You gotta pass the exam, but it's based. What you did during the year is gonna count for like 70%, and the, the exam is only 30%. Mm -hmm. So, and many times, and many students, uh, when they are under pressure, they don't have the same ability to respond to uh, what they know and to show the knowledge. And I I think that they are screwed because of that. That's what I'm saying. What about uh, Bangladesh, Una? Bangladesh, I would like to say that um, in Bangladesh, English is our second language, and we learn English since kindergarten. Mm -hmm. If United States Spanish is our second language <laughs> in US, then I think we should learn a language since first grade, not on ninth grade. I learned Spanish in ninth grade, 10th grade because I was a ESL student. <laughs> that would help students to know a different language when they go to travel around the world so they can speak that language. They don't have to learn it when they're in their 20s and they can get anything in their head. I learned, <laughs> I learned three different, four different languages when I was in second grade. Wow. wow. Fatima, what about uh, Pakistan? The only thing I want to say is that they should adopt from my country schools that is respect your teacher, your elders, because even though like there's a lot of opportunities, but I see the students they show they don't show respect to their teacher. That is the most important thing because when you don't have respect for someone, how you are gonna respect your own self? And <laughs> Because like Asian um, schools and universities, they are way ahead in math and science. So like the stuff we learn here in college, we did in middle schools. <laughs> so that is the thing like, you know you guys have a lot of opportunities, but the thing is like, you should work on your math and science. <laughs> I thought about it, thought about it, thought about it last night, and that's what I came up with. 
free higher education. Um, I think it's something that exists in Brazil and it, it makes it a lot easier on. Um, how yeah. do you do the, 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 the government pays for, for, for it, you know? Um, so, um, it not maybe not for everyone, but for those that can pass that um, national exam that I told you about. I mean, that in a way would. Um, I agree, you know, so uh, do really well in, 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 you know, primary, secondary education. Do well, study hard um, so you can pass that test and um, receive free education, um, higher education. So um, now we're going to open the mic uh, to, for questions. If anyone has any questions you would like to ask, um, we'll start with <laughs> So we can put a mic over here. We have a mic stand. Oh, we have one of the mics, and then I don't know if we have one. Okay, we're going to start. There is a mic stand over there. Oh, you know what? I can run out. Or who has a question over here? Okay, we're going to start over here. Okay, the question for um, the teacher from India is. You say they speak 28 language, right? Every state they speak their own language. Okay. Are they understand each other or not? Do they understand each other? Yes. Uh, it is a challenge sometimes. Like I grew up in the South, so I knew two South Indian languages. Uh, I, and I learned the national language, so I could travel. You get a smattering, but basically English has become a link language between the states. But every form in India, right? has three languages, English, the national language, and the state language. So you can fill out all the forms, whichever language you're speaking. So that's amazing, because here everything is in English, and they don't want to do it in two languages. It's kind of interesting. We have a question back here. Okay. Uh, my question is to all of you, actually. Um, there's beauty in everyone's country, and including in our own, obviously. That's why everybody want to come here. But, um, my question is, what pushes you to continue your education in spite of all the, you know, trials and tribulations of your own countries? You can barely hear me. Huh? What, what, what pushes me to continue? Oh boy. Uh, I think it's, at, a, at a certain point, it's hard to go back. <laughs> um, I've just recently finished my PhD, and there were moments where I thought, oh my god, what did I get myself into? Because uh, the academic job market was really rough, you know, very competitive. And it's not uh, uh, the, 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 the cause and effect uh, formula, the more education you have, the more opportunities you have, that's a very flawed, mythical hypothesis. The more education you have, you, you end up being highly qualified for many other opportunities. But what pushes me is probably my eagerness to uh, explore. Uh, I, I'm a philosopher of education, so I, I was eager to keep on doing research, exchanging ideas, being in settings just like this one, exchanging ideas and being able to uh, write, read, and uh, hopefully contribute to a uh, community service, you know, by being here. This is the service work that we all have gathered here. So these are the settings that actually kept me going, other than the, the nightmares that I had during my PhD. And, <laughs> and, and to tell you the truth, I mean, financially, if you want to get a financially rewarding position, where we're at right now is not the, the solution. I mean, we're not in this for the money. I guess this is more of an idealist position where we are doing service work, and uh, the, the the satisfaction that you get from that work is what keeps you going. Languages. 
I feel that they put too much pressure on you, uh, kids now on MCAS, which has nothing to do with really speaking a different language. Mm -hmm. So they just put too much pressure, and that's why it's not a big concern of us learning a different language. And I think having a good support system is more important than anything, too. Because it's hard to be you know, with everybody's everyday life. Most people have kids, you know, they are in school, you have to help them with their education while in the process of trying to help yourself. I just first of all want to thank the students because this takes a lot of courage and, and confidence to get up here and do this. So I want to thank you guys all for contributing. Excuse me, and then I want to ask the students, you've talked about the differences in your educational systems. What was the most challenging part of becoming a part of the American educational system? What did you find the most difficult? For me, when I first came here, when I was I was in seventh grade, I attended Talbot Middle School. I had to call my teacher with his name, and I felt so uncomfortable calling my teacher with a name. It was like I'm disrespecting my teacher. In another word, guru. We are not supposed to disrespect our elder with their calling their name. Even if I see someone unknown, like from uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. I would call them, like if they're a little bit older than me, I would call them uncle or brother. Just say, hello brother or hello sister. I will never call them by their name. So with teacher, we believe that after parents, teacher is the second place right after parents. And you should not call your teachers by name. So we have to call by the name. And some teachers were like, oh, I have a name. You don't call me miss or ma'am. You have to call me by um, Mr. K or Mr. V, whoever it is. You have to call by the letter or by the name. That was uncomfortable. Do we have one more question? I saw in play our kids fan play me to go on in my head.
We are all part of many systems. And some of us have been blessed because some of the systems that are close to my life, they have supported me on a personal level, you know. I mean, my daughter has become, I mean, I had to raise her as a single parent, not by choice, but by law, by death. But I can only stand here because I have a circle of friends who are just like my brothers and sisters for all of these years. So now I see myself giving to everybody else because now I can be available to a lot of people who were available to me. And I think we need to develop From that. different thing. places, yeah. different walks of life, different situations. So each case is a different case. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question down here. Okay, um, in preschool through fifth grade in the United States, we were all taught reading and writing. I was wondering about, in your different countries, early reading and writing. <laughs> in, a, in my country, you study reading and the writing and the math uh, from the, in the preschool and the science, biology, geology, physics and chemistry in the middle school and they stay in the same, same thing in the high school. In Brazil, it's still a challenge. Um, it's something that uh, we're still working to, you know, provide um, the same level of education. I mean, accessibility. I would have to say education is the same, but you know, uh, accessibility. Um, but we're making great strides, and things are getting better, and better. And um, um, I would like to thank our panelists. Uh, please let's uh, give. <laughs> wonderful questions. Um, I hope you have a great week. Thank you. Don't forget to pay attention to more One Book events that are coming up. Lots more events on this campus, New Bedford, and Attleboro coming up in the next couple of months.